Well, it's my pleasure uh, to, to welcome you to Loyola University of Chicago here in, uh, on the banks of the Great Lake, Michigan. Uh, I'm Mike Murphy and I direct the Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage. And uh, we're happy to have you as our guest uh, for an evening with Mihalo Shio. I always want to thank Joan and Bill Hank uh, for their generous gift that helps us do this wonderful programming and to bring people like Mihal here. Uh, it really is a is a uh, embarrassment of riches. Um, I feel like I've won the lottery to be able to do this. Uh, I also want to point for this crowd here, if you like uh, poetry, uh, and who doesn't like poetry, especially the way that Mihal does it. Um, we were having a major conference next year, next September. It's the, it's the third biannual Catholic Imagination Conference. And we'd love you to be our guest then as well. We have a save the date and we'll have a website up soon. But this is major, uh, major um, writers and poets. Alice McDermott, Tobias Wolf, Dana Joya, Richard Rodriguez, Fanny Howe have committed. Mihal will likely be here. Uh, and others of a certain caliber that take uh, writing and faith very seriously. So we hope you can join us for that. But for tonight, we have Mihal, and we're just uh, delighted he's here. Uh, you know, uh, Mihal will set the stage for his reading. He's going to he's going to give us the, the stage for the for his um, tour de force here, the five quintets, and he he will set up uh, before he begins his reading. Uh, we were going to forego a Q and A, but there will be chance to speak afterwards if you want to come to the book signing table. That's how we're going to do it tonight. So. Um, that's a good way to interact, and I think you'll see, uh, I've heard Mihal read a couple times already today, and it's, it's so nourishing, and so we want to be able to, to leave it as it is, as a pristine kind of performance of, of art, okay? So thank you for that. Uh, just a short uh, bio of Mihal, really a brief. Um, born in Dublin, raised on the south side, went to school the same place as James Joyce, Klongos, uh, by the Jesuits, Trinity College, 1964 to 1968, um, taught for a while, did some, went to school as well in, in Nor Norway. Um, is it nine languages, Michal? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a linguist for many years in the classroom and giving lectures all around town, Harvard and Yale and what have you. And then enough of that, uh, poetry made the call and it was poetry from then on. Um, 16 or 17 books of poetry and other occasional pieces as well. This book you have before you is a 10-year project, and uh, all that goes with that. So it's our sincere delight to welcome Michal O'Shiel, and please do welcome Michal to the podium. Good evening, and I want to just add my thanks, first of all, to Joan and Bill Hank for this centre, and my thanks also to Dr. Michael Murphy for inviting me, uh, and to all of his staff and what they've done. Be with me, Madam Jazz, I urge you now. Riff in me so I can conjure how you breathe in us more than we dare allow. In words, in hues, in tones, please, madam, blow, play in me the grace I need to know. How, in your complex glory, we let go. Show how an open hand is worry-free, spark again your love's economy, your generous first words spoken, let there be. Enhance our trust in hard-earned betterment, Humbler world we may in turn augment in long adagios of increment. While marveling at your choreography, stars and quarks beyond our mastery, we still explore to praise your mystery. Although each sacred book's a lip read score, improvising, there is always more. You jazz and what's your own? and our rapport. Each solo and ensemble of a piece, grooves and tempos shifting without cease, we flourish in a syncopated peace. In all our imperfections we advance, trusting in creation's free-willed chance. Sweet Madam Jazz, in you we are the dance. 
That is the epigraph to this, to these five quintets. I think if it's an election night, T.S. Eliot might be asking for a recount. It's a sustained reflection on modernity across 400 years with its people and its movements, the movers and shakers across modernity. It's also an attempt to take stock as to where we are now at this point where there seems to have been a paradigm shift. Some call it post-modernity, some call it late modernity, chastened modernity, but there has been a fall of old certainties and certainly a paradigm shift of some sort. Now, Dante summed up the Middle Ages as we approach the, uh, on the cusp of modernity. So the five quintets are, and I risk humus, I risk, uh, I risk absolutely hubris in saying this, but is an attempt to sum up what has happened throughout modernity, throughout this 400 years, and to create some sort of a vision as to where we may be pointed. Dante had a three-partite structure, as, as you'll know, of course, hell, purgatory, and heaven. I have gone for a five um, partite or a five part structure um, and I have five quintets what I want to do is to try and catch the fabric of a society and so I have a quintet on the arts a quintet on economics I call the arts one making the, the one on economics is called dealing then I have a quintet on politics called steering then one on science called finding and a final one on theology stroke philosophy called meaning and these five quintets are my way of looking at, so, so to speak, vertically through this 400-year period. Now, each of these quintets, to give this a vertical unity, so each quintet seems to be a whole, is in a different form. Uh, and I have done, gone for a mixture of classical forms and invented forms. The arts form is in what I call a saiku. I take the most classic form from the East, which is a haiku, and the most classic form from the West, which is a sonnet, and I put them together and I get a saiku by inter interspersing the sonnets with haikus. But there's a nicety to this because in Japanese, saiku means craftsmanship. Now, I've also used in the science section finding, I've used iambic pentameter, and I, in the meaning section, which is the philosophy stroke theology, I've gone for, in memory of Dante, terza rima. But I hasten to add, he had an easier time. In Italian, every word ends with a vowel. It's a trickier bet in English. Uh, I've also then, in economics, for the economics section, in dealing and in steering, the political section, I have invented forms to, to, uh, for them. So it's a mixture of the classical and the invented. Now, these thinkers, economists, science, scientists, I hasten to add, live very complex lives and, like you and me, are full of contradictions. All of them are rooted in their time and place, but some seem to me to transcend their time and place and help create an angle of vision for where we may be headed. So, each of the quintets has, again, five parts, keeping this five motif. And, as I said before, I have two extra ones on Dante. The first one I'm interested in is the transitional figures, the figures that mark are going into, the, into modernity from the Middle Ages. And you can, you can think of them. I, I'll point them out to you, uh, obviously. I'll point out who the people are as I speak of them. But, but just think of it. Just think of in, in the arts Cervantes, for example, who was mocking knighthood, but with a nostalgia when you really read him. So, so he's... he's, he's on this transition between the Middle Ages and our modernity. You can think, of course, across in science, you've Copernicus, think in, think, think in meaning, think in theology, stroke philology, uh, philosophy, you have uh, Luther, uh, and, 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 and so forth. It's, it's, in economics, the obvious person, of course, is Adam Smith, uh, who sets, sets, sets us into modernity. Now, the second of these, going down, as I said, taking this vertical approach, the second of my, of my cantos, I call them cantos, uh, uh, are figures who, there's a shift, it's very strange, because in the arts it goes towards what you might call greater liberty, but it begins in politics to, uh, uh, to go towards more fixity. So you have this almost polarization taking place in modernity. 
Then the third section, which gently, and I say gently, I don't overemphasize this, but echoes Dante's hell. And that is the nadir, if you like, of modernity, where you get extreme, for me anyway, extreme interiority, extreme lack of community in, in terms of the arts uh, um, and individualism. Whereas on the other side, you, you begin to get f more fixity, or a re in the economics, a reaction, but more about that in a minute. Then in the fourth of these cantos, going to, again, lightly echoing or reverberating Dante's uh, purgatory, we have figures who realize that modernity somehow was going astray. It needed, it needed a fresh vision. And they, they seek it, but they don't quite find it. So they, fall, they, they point towards a paradise, but not quite there. And in the fifth one, I have all my friends, the people I admire, the people I want to be with. That's my heaven, my Dante, my Dante in heaven. Uh, um, these, and I feel that all, these are right across. Up to that, it's been chronological. But these people are people who, right across the 400 years, seem to have some transcendent quality beyond their time and place. So let's move to looking at the actual figures. And I'm going to, this being in poetry, I'm going to concentrate on the arts, but I'm going to take some examples from the other cantos as we move vertically down. So I start with, who are the transitional figures in the arts? I've mentioned Cervantes as a very obvious figure, but also think of John Donne. Uh, John Donne is fascinating because he sometimes the sun goes around the earth and sometimes the earth goes around the sun. He's on this, this border. Uh, uh, the the uh, Rubens is another figure, fascinating figure, because he represents the rise of the bourgeoisie, which again is part of the, part of the setting in of modernity. And Milton is another figure because he is... Copper fastens the Reformation, if you like. He's the great, the great, he's the great poet of the, of the Reformation. Uh, then in music, a very interesting figure is, is, um, is Handel, because he, he, took, he took music out of the church. Music had been in the church, and he brought it into the concert hall with the oratorios, which were halfway between, the, between church music and what we come to know as concerts. But it was that move out of the church. So I'm going to, I'm going to just take um, these, I'm going to take two, two figures from this to illust illustrate it. And the first one I'm going to take is, is John Donne. Um, now I just need to explain one more thing, and that is that with these, with the, with, with these uh, psychos, how it works out, it's a conversation. I'm in conversation with these figures th throughout the book. These are, as I said, I'm not going to read the haikus because they're in italics and I find it very hard to read in italics. It just doesn't work. Uh, I, I want, I, it confuses things. So it's just going to be the two voices, the sonnets. So I address the figure in question. The figure answers me. I then come back again to the figure. And the final, the fourth one then is when I leave the last word to the person in question. Uh, um, so I'll pause between them, but you've got to get that pattern, as I said, where I'm conversing with them. First me, then the, the figure involved, back to me, and then I leave the last word to the uh, person in question. Are you the wanton Jack, or Dr. Dunn, or both? Becoming every part you play, a lover chiding the unruly son, our preacher warning all who disobey. Are you the Catholic boy, your mother's son, whose people still would rather die than stray? Our Protestant believing all are one, that all may hear, Lord, hear us when we pray. The new philosopher whose son must stay and bid the passive earth about it run, our wooer whose son's motion trace a day to thwart love makings only just begun. In showy puns, in fan tailed conceit, your actor's role and you conspire to meet. Why can't you fathom all my reasons why? My tortured brother gave his chaplain's name, then died in jail of fever and of shame. A strutting youth, I didn't want to die. 
Why can't you see the whys that underlie why Jack and Dr. Don are both the same? I underwent travail and overcame my youthful self, my overweening eye. So what if now the sun commands the sky? Philosophy can claim and counterclaim. To ask God's mercy is the preacher's aim. Hear us, weak echoes, O thou ear and cry. My words take up each mood and moment's cue. No player has our playwright's overview. Although your thought takes words, and words take wings, there's still, still some self-absorption in your tone, as brooding on your life's imaginings, an inward mind makes every world its own. A time so full of angst and hankerings, of reason not content with what's unknown, your God becomes the workman of all things. You too have stepped beyond the hallowed zone. Whilst our physicians by their lore are grown, and we don't hang from old wives' apron strings, that self-same faith in reason will dethrone a God who thrusts, trusts to sacred righted kings. Enchanted worlds begin to disappear once you have walked outside the sacred sphere. No Shakespeare hiding in a bigger cast. I strut the stage of my dramatic mind. You too were once an iconoclast, determined, self-assured, and flying blind. A later self, our youth's own counterblast, Again, like me, you leave one act behind and in one woman's love rewrite a past that childhood's flaws and hurts had undermined. My poems are moods I wanted to outlast myself and catch the thrill of thought refined. For all our likeness, so much to contrast, I bless your Dantean sweep of humankind. Three-person God is battering you to see what was and is now shaping what's to be. The second figure from this transition in the arts that I've chosen is Rubens. And I'm absolutely fascinated by the intersection of the personal life with how these people I've chosen to represent the various eras of modernity, how, the, how their personal lives influence, influence what they do and, and ultimately influence history. Rubens had a scandal in the family. The father had been up to something terrible which upset him all his life. But his real thing was, of course, that he marks the change into modernity because he detested being dependent on monarchs and on prelates and the like and, and wanted to be independent. A painter envoy extraordinaire. You, Rubens, craved the black hole of success. A driven man, the top and nothing less. A Michelangelo? But why stop there? A global citizen, an homme de fer. Your endless energy still can't redress. A father's shameful fall that you suppress in brushes hued and stroked with manic care. The best and greatest, yet so self-aware. Compeer of prelates and of all noblesse, you're banking on a new assertiveness that Europe's bourgeoisie are soon to dare. You feed them all of hungry self-esteem and chase a shadowed fame from dream to dream. I keep a deep and sensuous self in check. An Antwerp burger 
never second best. I zig and zag, yet don't stick out my neck, but work to lay my father's ghost to rest. Whatever drives me, I will never tire. A business sense still wants me to be free, to pick and choose the work that I desire, portraying clients who can pay my fee. Both under church and monarchies, I knew an artisan would have to tack and trim. But wealth achieves what gills can never do and frees an artist from a patron's whim. I preen my gift and steering my career, I'll match Italian masters I revere. Careerist, dreading scandal or disgrace, you marry steady Isabella Brandt with rough and busk and whalebone carapace, so primped and passionately elegant. No carnival or slip betwixt the cup and lip, no risks of love's come hither row, for all your genius still so buttoned up, one perfect husband and his teenage frau. What flashes through a mind is best unknown. A scent, an eyebrow raised, descent a stare. Such self-control and no emotion shown. New stoical sang-froid and savoir-faire. A youthful hearth and trauma stains are in. Your dream of burgers ordered discipline. But have you seen my young Hélène with fur? Ambitions push and drive have acquiesced in her, and now for her, with her, by her, with nudes and landscapes, see how I'm possessed. The heiress bred in bone will out in flesh. Her fifth child sired just weeks before I die. In old age my desire and spirit mesh, undressing her for every naked eye, once diplomat and youthful Arabist, I angled for church work. A man of means, I'm artisan become my patron's peer and second wife's besotted lyricist. Outsider painting Flemish country scenes, the moods of Europe shift in my career. We move to the Second canto, which is where, as I said, you get this, particularly in the arts, this move towards a sort of what I would call greater freedom. There's more individualism. You're, of course, moving into the romantic movement now, where suddenly you find sublimity is replacing God. It's nature and the sublime and so forth is much more important than, than any, any, any thought of, of a God. You even get a sort of urban decadence. And the figures I'm thinking of, the fi and I, I, I hasten to add, these, people are, these figures that I choose are simply symbolic of a particular tendency, a particular movement within, within uh, modernity. Um, they're not, they're not, they're not uh, exclusive, but rather um, representative. The people I have here are Goya, Goethe, Beethoven, Wordsworth, and Baudelaire, who all seem to me to represent this, this, greater, this greater freedom. I always, I'm always torn between which one to go for here, but I think I'm going to go for Beethoven this, uh, this evening. He seems to me to be the perfect romantic. Um, uh, um, there's, uh, the self-drama is there, and the great, the great... Who was it said once, was it, that Bach, um, uh, Bach was the music of God? Mozart was music for music, isn't that it? Uh, and and uh, Beethoven was about Beethoven. Uh, uh, the... Uh, and of course, his, his, uh, if you, apparently they did an x-ray one time in one of his manuscripts and he, it went away down. He, uh, and they ended up with the same thing at the bottom as was at the top, but it was a hard, hard process in between. So Beethoven. Proud Beethoven, you come to make your mark as rhythm by sullen rhythm 
Your will begets a gentler dove that flies the coop of dark and rage subsides in beautiful regrets. You struggle to endure, not just to please, to navigate all whims and psychic states, a music veers and tacks through distant keys, detours and ponders dreams, then ruminates beyond the measured zones of reason's grace. Each squall a palimpsest of elmbo grease that earns a cam which sings above a grumbling bass, an inner seascape's deep and hard-won peace. No craftsman here, creator of your art, a genius truculent and set apart. So much, so much I thought I would do to wife, to settle down, Cantabile. But somehow deeper down in me I knew my muse would storm again and I'd obey. I meant to travel but never reach the sea. Instead, like Shakespeare, every human mood must find a voice and bear its melody. In one man's soul, all lines of latitude. As nature ekes its dawns from satin nights, my notes transverse a still unplotted chart. Beyond polyphony are court delights. I sound the depths of unbeholden art. I mean to shake what logic has confined. Let passion stir up reason's sleepy mind. Through all my churning youth, I was a fan. I never could repay the debt I owe. Yet swarthy, head-bent, testy Ludwig Van, why is it that you never quite let go? Your brother's wives you always sought to blame. Those servants you so suddenly dismiss, a nephew your own smother love will maim your shadowed self, a semitone from bliss. Such hurricanes of phrases scratched and quilled that grope the dark before the light can break. Each anchorage achieved by odyssey, the swaying song of some desire fulfilled that riptides of your temper sweep away, deep currents still unease serenity. Long gone my pride, that youthful mutineer, and now my death sealed years will rub and fret farewell discourses, I insist you hear, my close-knit crisscross chamber tete a tete. All hotter shed, and yet hot blood begets hot thoughts which scud inside my silent head. A voyage logged in five unheard quartets, where all that's said leaves just as much unsaid. In closing lean and inward traffickings, no bravado now, or flourishes decoy the rumbling conversation of the strings as resignation climbs at last to joy. A note comes home, a final tonic kiss, Applaud, my friends, remember me for this. I just want now to, to give the equivalent canto in economics. Strangely, in economics, what had happened was, rather than the move towards fixity in politics, it was an immediate reaction, because after Adam Smith and Ricardo and Malthus and so on had shown us that there were regulations, that, were, that we seem to be in, in the power of forces, economic forces beyond our control, there was a reaction, an idealistic reaction, with people such as, um, such as um, uh, Henri de Saint-Simon, Robert Owen, Charles Fourier, John Stuart Mill, and of course there was the um, American, the American uh, then Henry George. 
I think I'm going to go for, to, I, 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 Henry George is probably the one to read in America, but I have been reading, I have been reading Mill because he was a, a very, very fascinating figure. Um, the, the, um, he's fascinating because he was way ahead of his time. He wanted um, to, uh, he, he wanted to have public parks. He wanted to have a proportional representation. There was all sorts of, all sorts of uh, things which, which he wanted. Uh, um, but at the same time, he was a complete uh, imperialist. He wanted to absorb the, the Welsh, and they shouldn't be there at all. The Scots were to be absorbed. The Raj was to be absorbed. Uh, and yet, he wanted public parks. He wanted uh, an international police. So a very, very complex figure. But I'm just going to read you a small piece uh, in, his, in his voice as he, he addresses the other um, economists. Yes, Maltus, though your theory is right, at 17 I found, out, I found one summer's night a child some parent choked and left aside. I pamphleteered the poor on birth control, a sponge and bobbin beat infanticide. Would you too, Robert Owen, I remonstrate, you counter-punishing the poor whose fate is shaped for crime and mock this stricter mill. Society as well as they themselves can surely both reshape a misformed will. And you say, I know, and was a week with you, and Saint Simon, I made my own your view of history, and how what's right and good was countered will dissolve, in, when countered will dissolve in something new. What's now must one day too become dead wood. But you, Ricardo, you're my friend and guide. A boy you mentioned me, a boy you mentored me, and when you died I'd learn from you those economic laws as fixed as nature's strict and firmest rules, which fighting is to fight a hopeless cause. We both well know the soil can bear so much, and labour's more or less of use as such. Hard facts we have to face no matter what, that, like rules of gravity we learn, the laws were given, liking it or not. But as for wages, profits are raised rent. These belong to human management. Ricardo, you and Smith have both combined producing goods and how we share our gain, and so our sharing seems all predefined. What galls or chafes us we can rearrange. The things we do not like are ours to change. Some wealth is earned and some I call unearned. Some slave while others gain while still asleep. This is unfair as far as I'm concerned. Stuart Mill, of course, was um, also one of these intersections because he'd been bullied by his father into, this, into his views to an extent. So he was haunted by his father all his life. Again, this crossover seems to fascinate. But let's move to the third canto as we go down vertically through these five cantos. And this for me is the... the um, this is, if you like, likely corresponding to, to hell, to, to the, it's the nadir of modernism. And again, I emphasize that this is not a literary treatise or, or an artistic treatise. It's, it's, it's a question of finding representatives to show the tendencies that modernity was going through at the time. It's excessive, to my, my mind, excessive interiority, excessive individualism, and a complete lack of community to, to, an, to an extent. And it's represented by um, figures such as Wagner, Yeats, Picasso, Joyce, and Kafka. Um, I puzzled earlier when I was thinking it through as to who I would read for you, but as I probably wouldn't dare read the Joyce one in Dublin, I'll read it in Chicago. <laughs> oh, one-eyed Joyce, so proud and so obsessed, with inward-looking Dublin left for dead. You traipse through Paris, Zurich, Entry, Est. 
both turning from and into what you fled. Half blind and hoarding, borrower engrossed in weaves of mind, yet posed and self-aware. Become your feckless father's punster ghost, you cock a snook at years of dons you snare. A peeping Tom with skittish schoolboy thrills, your life less lived than held by words at bay. You thimble rig each mood to grist your mills, all others walk on parts in your world's play. Betrayed betrayer, guilts poet modi, forever fleeing nets, you never flee. I'm proud, but have no pride, whatever way my meanest means are justified by ends. All serve to delve my mind's soliloquy, my patronesses, rivals, faithful friends. A willing exile with my town within, a modernist I'll make a day stand still, although I don't believe I love to sin and thrive on each taboo and furtive thrill. Confess the contradictions, even doubt. Of course, in all the casts of selves I mime, my own distrust, my impulse to betray, an in-depth guilt that I turn inside out, wool gathers up a world I warp in time, the criss-cross mindscape of one Dublin day. I love your language, burbling up in fun, and am as good a reader as you'll get to understand your punning river run. I know the charge of words, and yet, and yet, such Proustian compulsions to detail the dreamlike doodling of an introvert. For me, a microscope too small in scale, the heydays of your endless blab and blurt. You grub around the psyche's secret lair of daily reverie and riddled night to lay a haunted mind's meanderings bare. But in the end, does anything take flight? Oh, Mr. Joyce, I fear your joyless gaze, that inward stare involved in its own maze. I too was of my time, and so I fled. I couldn't bear the nism's golden calf. I chose the loner's monologue instead. Have I become too clever now by half? I pun, I joke, I dig, and I lapoon both friends and foes as long as I can freeze my Dublin town's cuckold day in June. Yet satire somehow lacks love's joy and ease. For all the wit and fun at Finnegan's wake and martyred Stephen D. within his maze, still once at least, though in a woman's voice, I didn't pun or try to be opaque, but spoke my shortest playful word of praise. And yes, in Molly's yes, I did rejoice. I had the fascinating experience um, last week of reading that poem in the presence of Oliver O'Donovan in, um, in Edinburgh, who is Frank O'Connor's son. Uh, and uh, I said to him rather tentatively at the dinner table at a meal afterwards, was I too hard on Joyce? And he, he replied, my father would have agreed. <laughs> so I felt somewhat justified. Um, I'm not sure I'd still risk Dublin. The, um, I moved to the same corresponding canto in, in politics. Now here we are moving in, in this polarization towards great fixity, towards the isms. The isms, of course, of, of the last century, the bloodiest century humanity has probably ever experienced. 
there are two wings to it. There's the more humane side of it, which is represented by the extremes of Thatcherism, which rejected society and community. The, more, the less humane, the, in fact, the inhumane side, side of it is, of course, are people like Bakunin, Stalin, Hitler, and ben, Bin Laden. And, of course, also Stalin. I think I'm going to go for Stalin uh, as, as, as a representative of it. Strange how even, even Stalin, but all the millions of kulaks that he, man, that he, that he killed, and the awful, awful way he brought people up only just to, to have them killed. He, as, soon as, they, as soon as they got established in his regime, he had them killed off because it was a safer bet. Uh, here, here you see the absolute loneliness of his end. Russia's fabric torn beyond what mends, even when he makes his half retreats, downward spirals inward and around, sink and sink and double on themselves. Lonely emperor befriending cooks, even joking with his bodyguards, seeks out boyhood pals to sing church hymns. Both wives dead, the second shot herself. One son's dead, the other drinks through life, and Svetlana, his one daughter's life, is a mess. Seminarian, become so doctrinaire. Stalin's, Stalin's father bullies all his life, reaching out beyond the Tsar's empire. Fearing to disturb the sleeping giant, guards find him dying, stricken and alone. Buffer states outdated by missiles, boundaries don't respect the broadcast wave, western clothes and music still seep in, mindless of the blood and bone it cost. Stalin's shut-up system somehow leaks. Though his Russia's now a superpower, left alone, unable to adapt, apathy and dissidence abound. Hell is a closing off of otherness. But now I move to the fourth canto, which is again, roughly paralleling Dante's purgatory. And here are the people with the vision, but not quite, not quite there. The people in the arts which, who represent this for me are Dostoevsky, um, who, of course, had this wonderful insight to compassion, which was uh, his vision. Uh, um, Mahler, uh, what was it they said of Mahler? Was it that every, ever, every silver lining had a cloud? Uh, uh, Rilke, then, of course, one of my great favorites, uh, 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 extraordinary um, poet, wonderful poet. Um, like he somehow didn't make it to the joy of paradise, but, but what a brave man. He died t without taking drugs, a terrible death in order to experience it. Just uh, ex an extraordinary, ex extraordinary figure. D.H. Lawrence, of course, who went for sensuality as the answer to what had happened in modernity. And again, I'm all for sensuality, but it only goes so far. And then T.S. T. S. Eliot. Um, this is an interesting one because obviously I'm echoing his title with the five quintets. But it's interesting because when I first read this poem, I read it in, in Duke in North Carolina to a group who were interested in theology and the arts. Uh, and uh, one, of, one theologian who was there, uh, Richard Hayes, um, immediately afterwards, Richard said, I want to show you something. And he went off and he got a paper and he showed me a paper he'd written to say that he thought he was missing a quartet. He had never got beyond the fire and the purification and the selflessness, but had never got to the resurrection. He didn't understand the resurrection. So I, I go, let's go for T.S. Eliot this evening. And, and um, uh, I think maybe, maybe I owe it to him having, having upped his title. Your tone impersonal and passionless, as ruling your own roost in Russell Square, you turn our pained superior T.S. to wonder 
do I dare and do I dare? Your grandfather ingrained in you an Eliot commands a hamlet you are not meant to be. With chilly politesse and touch me not, more English than the English care to be. And yet, however steely and astute, aware how wastelands of the self can slide, your temperament demands an absolute to order seas of doubt which rage inside the toothed gullet of an aged shark. And will you dare to leap out from the dark? You know the fear I barely hold at bay. The littered waste that lines the ocean floor, my dreaded void, our cultural decay. How I, by will, belong to right and lore. Tradition I must bow to and then bend, as even in my leap I ease my arc, so each beginning gestures towards its end, as I both dare the light and hint at dark. How strange that I, who struggle to avoid what's personal despite myself, must feed on inner history, tradition's king without forbear or heir, I birth a void. All move in measures still unpedigreed. My everything becomes its counter thing. Your loan, who then devised the torment love. O Thomas Stearns, a thrift-taught, uptight boy, you are dodging, cutting loose. Although the dove descending breaks the air, it brings no joy. A static view, maybe some stoic lack, regards the present with opprobrium. Your absolute keeps tending to look back and shudders at the shape of things to come. In mixing reminiscence and desire, the soul sap quivers, brief sun flames the ice, unless restored by that refining fire. Your daring must fall short of paradise. And yet, old possum, your quartet's in trance, when from the still point you still stir the dance. My driving will, my mother's driven son, my artist's cold, both Brahman and Urbane. Was I all things to all and friend to none? To be a poet cost me too much pain. Although to thaw my ego I had learned to woo a god with prayer and discipline, surrounded by a sense of grace discerned, Yet even hard-won faith was honed within. But wait, once for delete, instead write stet, and let my lover's voice just soar to life. A fifth quartet, or should I say quintet? One carefree dedication to my wife, to whom God knows I owe my leap's delight. In this um, fourth canto now, I want to take, take, take you to, to the science. And it's uh, the fixity was in science was, of course, the, the nader in science in the previous three was when they thought that everything tied down. Everything was understood or almost understood. And then, of course, the subatomic world broke and everything was to change. Uh, um, and Einstein, of course, is part of that. I mean, it's, it's, he's an amazing character because when you think of the science genius, you immediately see the electrified hair and you think, you think of Einstein. And there's something wonderful about it because he, attracts, he always attracts great humor. I, I, you know that famous one, the, you know, the, 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 there was a young lady called Bright who could travel faster than light. She went off one day in a relative way and came back the previous night. 
Uh, uh, he, he, there's, there's also, also these great stories told of how, how he went in, I mean, they're apocryphal, but he, how he went in with Heisenberg in for, to a bar, to a bartender. Uh, this is rather subtle, but he went into the bartender and uh, he said, I want a beer for myself and a beer for Herr Heisenberg. And the bartender scratched his head a bit and he looked at him and he said, but um, Dr. Einstein, is Herr, is, 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 um, is, is, um, is Herr Heisenberger here? And there was a silence for a minute, and Einstein thought, and he said, well, he is and he isn't. <laughs> that takes a little bit of thinking. Uh, um, he, 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 he's, um, so, but the, the uh, of course, his, his, he, he was onto the atomic subworld, but he didn't make the leap because he couldn't accept the probability. He couldn't accept the Copenhagen School of Bohr and, and what, in other words, the whole quantum and the, the, the probability. He wanted things more certain. Strangely, he ended up in Princeton, uh, and what the companion he had there who, who was um, what was uh, Gödel, the mathematician, uh, and. It's very interesting because they were known to go for walks in Princeton together the whole time. Gödel was much younger, but they both had, had these early careers uh, and were dis they both had this, were unable to make this extra leap. Do they fill out each other's might have been? Einstein, the physicist that Gödel dreamt of, and Gödel, the maths man Einstein left behind. They share a German-speaking world they fled, and each has done his ripest work while young. But more than this, for both, the meaning counts. For Gödel, there's nothing due to accident. For Einstein, God is always imminent. And seeking minds have left these men misfits, for both the relative and incomplete, no softening to, va to a vague subjective view but proof of some great truth beyond themselves, the sacred Euclid book of Einstein's youth, the far out yonder found in certain laws. But discontented with what merely works, these Platonists are walking side by side to purgatorial disciples who can hear the chant beyond the wall of fire yet somehow never managed to pass through, to wear a stubborn independent streak which in their bloom could serve them both so well, might come to terms with something less precise, relearning childlike plays of paradise where gambling God can throw a lover's dice. So now I move to the delight of paradise. And here, I couldn't resist it in, in the um, art section. I had five in each of the other sections, but I tripled it. There's 15 in heaven. I wanted an abundance in heaven. Uh, um, and even there, you don't get them all in. And always people say, well, why isn't, uh, somebody said to me, why isn't Johnny Coltrane there? Uh, uh, why isn't Hopkins there? Why isn't Schubert there? And I, got, I, I, was, I was in a group when this question was asked, and a lady who works in the National Gallery in London, um, came to my rescue and she said, it's like a Dutch still life where you've got a beautiful bouquet of flowers and you look at it and you admire it and you see what flowers in the bouquet, but you don't say, where are the other flowers? I think the first one I have to do, I'm going to read two of them. The first one I'm going to do is Dante because I feel I owe it to him. He, uh, it's a great tradition, of course. He had Virgil as his guide and I call him Dante as my guide. Uh, um, so it's... Uh, so I start, I'm going to start with, with, with Dante. My Dante, tell, tend nel mezzo del camin, forgotten bulbs, your time again, times again on earth, your gift to see a flowering unforeseen, to rake the soil for Europe's lush rebirth. A rich pre-modern mind allows you mix Rife thoughts retrieved with things so up to date in science, art, our purse, and politics, the cosmos in your seedbed city state. Your lily sign, Ferenza's exile sun. Why is that place assailed by so much strife? 
who name and face dead figures one by one, descending and ascending after life. Like conscious metaphor and fact combined, you parallel the purpose of God's mind. Ah, yes, the middle of the way, and yet recall the years I yearned a troubadour for Beatrice since May Day when we met one fateful moment in 1284. I break new ground and graft a comedy. I'm politician, poet, citizen. Though love can shape a tongue in Tuscany, I end an exile, never home again. With Virgil, I will climb hell's deepest ice to reach the doorway of the dead and weep till Beatrice, some knotting nerves in me, redeems my guilt. And braving paradise, I dare allow my sacred poem to leap from where we are to where we're meant to be. Your polymath and eager pioneer, who doubling back becomes a daring scout, defining our modernity's frontier by summing, summing up what somehow opens out. A fluke of birth, a lucky floroit, as banished and uncuddled by soft fame, you blame defectors sham and counterfeit, unhampered your cold hell will name and shame. But more, as certain as the second thief this day in paradise you too are shown, the smile whose warmth unzips the lily's leaf, the light eternal in itself alone, you're stretching still my mind and my desire to walk our daring god of love's high wire. But seven centuries beyond my theme, you've chosen to pursue the selfsame path and summing up an era work the seam between the modern and its aftermath. You've climbed from hell to heaven's vertigo. I'll be your guide. Though dazzled in that gaze, allow flawed words their spill and overflow, for God delights in lily gilding praise. Imagine all we've done are left undone, our broken longings, longing still for more, completed in the glory of one glance, and as both stars and atoms dance and dance, our lives unreal around one loving core, where all our wills and all desires are one. I'm going to read just one more from this uh, Arts Heaven, and then I'm going to conclude with the final, final um, pages of, of the book. So I think uh, I had been reading in Britain, I've been reading George Eliot. Uh, I, I didn't mention, or, well, let, let, me, let me give you my heaven. Dante, Shakespeare, Basho, Bach, Mozart, Coleridge, uh, Browning and Barrett, the, the Brownings, Eliot, and that's George Eliot, Cezanne, Chagall, Patrick Kavanagh, uh, Messian, and Brian Friel. Uh, there's a heaven. Uh, 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 I, 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 uh, I, Brian Friel read it, and uh, quite astonishingly, because he had been made a, a, a senator, uh, our Taoiseach, as we call our premier, our Taoiseach can appoint five senators. And one of them, was, he pointed, was Brian Friel at once. He attended all the meetings, faithfully came from Donegal and went back again and never opened his mouth. Uh, it never opened, it never spoke a word in the Senate. So I got a note back after he'd read it and with very complimentary things said, that he said, I think in that company I'm going to stay quiet. <laughs> so, uh, but let me, uh, I was in, well, when, when in Britain I was reading George Eliot because I didn't think they would know Willa Cather, but I think if I can, I think I'm going to, to, to go for Willa Cather tonight. Um, strangely, she's one of my three, one of my three great favorite, favorite novelists. 
Um, she uh, is um, alongside George Eliot. And my third would be Sigri Unset, which may not be as familiar to you all, a Norwegian, uh, a Norwegian novelist who wrote the famous Christine Laverin's Daughter, which I'm sure in the Midwest most people know of it because of the Norwegian connection and so forth. But then the extraordinary thing is that two of my three heroes, or heroines, met in New York in the war because when, uh, uh, when Sigri Unset had to flee because she had balled out the Nazis long before they got there. They wanted to get her as soon as they got into Norway. She escaped through Sweden to, to New York, where she spent the war propagandizing against the Nazis, but met with Willa Cather, fascinatingly. I see you, Willa Cather, as you watch your grandma's turban, gold-skinned slaves return from Canada, where she decamped. You notch it quietly up as grist for memories kern. Transplanted to Nebraska's beard grass plains, you root your teenage red cloud prairie years among Bohemians, the Magyar, Danes, and Swedes, the Poles and Czechs, oh pioneers. And youthful outsider love in you will grow, the ousted Pueblo people's history. French missioners who plied New Mexico, Quebec's old settlers' lifelong constancy, a tune persisting memories can taunt, a tune's persisting memories can taunt, each story hallows childhood things that haunt. You can't both eat the cake and keep it whole. I cho choose devotion's cost and sacred call. Though sacrifice puts iron in the soul, my life and work and love are one in all. My models were the grassroots minds I knew, the frontier folk, my friends, a diary I burgle. Yet I know how I imbue my men and women with so much of me. Yet sagas don't conform to our design. When artists love their art above all things, so much, it seems, seeps through ambition's sieve. Both Thea Kronberg's thoughts and dreams are mine. A married nightingale so seldom sings. My stories only know the life I live. Yet music's your life, it's passion and delight, and every word, a tone and tact you choose. Your lover e that Lewis was so right to praise the riffs and rhythms in your prose. For you, the new world's yearning Largo sees like scattered lights of settlers, lives that part in miles of maize and beard grass symphonies and hum the songs of Europe's homesick heart. And other novels seem to want to brew, but Wolfgang Amadeus dazzles most. Those final infirm years he bams you too. Will Bart and Albert Einstein boat play host and welcome you beyond the wailing wall to paradise regained for good and all? Once art, for art itself, or so I thought, unfolding people's souls at story pace, I fell in love with them and found I caught God's glimpse of glory in each human face. The little blue stem grass and spring that grew turns gently red once autumn has begun. I learn which years to bless both red and blue. For me, both faith and art would merge as one. The patient bending trees, the patient lives, the sum of small and daily things we do, more than the plot, our grand dramatic parts, are now that neither passes nor arrives, finds wholeness under, sun, under heaven's overview. All histories begin in human hearts. 
As I advance through heaven, I am accompanied for five days uh, by, by um, five wonderful women who, who guide, me, guide me through heaven. And in, in the heaven of, of meaning, in the heaven of, of the theology and philosophy, there are such figures as the five, the Jean, Jean Vanier, we have um, Hannah Arendt, the Muslim Nursi, Bonhoeffer, and John the Twenty-Third, and they're all playing jazz together. <laughs> the women that accompany me bring me there, and then I come to the final, the, the final vision. I thank my saints, but now a dazzling light begins to draw me to itself and woo me in the way a lover can invite you closer, still without compelling you. At once, your oldest and your latest flame, renewing thrills of your first rendezvous, a date with your one love and lifelong aim, a sweet compulsion burning from within that makes you want to drop your lover's name. To miss this mark, is still the only sin. But following a gleam, I'm now drawn home, a love returning to its origin. Is this the pull of wholeness, a shalom, that both attracts and gives a prepaid peace? I'm walking an arcade of trees, a dome of branches thickly leaved and of a piece, as though I'm mowing in moving in parentheses where there is both excitement and release from any inattention or unease which could distract me from the arch's eye. Where flooding light and rumors of a breeze round off a blazing horizontal sky which beckons me onwards and I respond. And yet for all this tunnel vision, I am certain still that this is not some fond farewell, that I have never been so close to all I love as moving now beyond the time and place of two-dimensioned prose. I hunger for the eye that beckons me along a funneled path between two rows of slightly tilted bowls where every tree is interwoven with its counterpart, convexing such a leafy canopy where opposites can meet and then depart in curves of paradox which shape the light. I can't yet understand but know by heart that nothing but desire can underwrite my passage through this vaulted light-led zone, that in this arch's eye all things unite. I'm solo here, but still not on my own, becoming more myself in resonance with those I love. I'm never all alone. Already in this arch as I advance, my loneness wound is healing in the eye whose rays now lead me to a skylit dance, a dizzy whirl, a giddy dervish high that pulses onwards to an ecstasy, once savoured for its wistful passing by. But dance no longer needs a brevity to add an edge to what might quickly pall. It peaks beyond my wildest fantasy that as it climaxes and seems to fall, the moment when a pleasure might abscond, it hasn't neared its apogee at all, but peaks again and so beyond, beyond, surprising me with infinite excess that nothing I have known can correspond to such abundant joy or could express a sweetness like the moment lovers bond in dewy aftermath without tristesse, so glistening and delighted in their fond embrace, just thrilling in each tipping kiss as willows glance the surface of a pond. My vase remembers every touch of bliss, each love not in our pleasure's daisy chain. Although no memory compares with this, each nervelet and synapse inside my brain finds images among its brick and brack to help an aging vessel to contain such joy. Just as some jumper stepping back before a leap recalls an old success, I bring to mind from my own beaten track delights I've known, the follies of jeunesse, the throb of what's achieved are things explored, each rush when the head and heart could coalesce. The high those times the body too had soared, and years of training paid off dividends, the ball I intercepted and so scored. 
But most of all, together with my friends, around a table where we drank and ate those evenings when time's rigid arrow bends. But now such pleasures all accumulate in tributaries that can amplify a whole creation flowing here in spate. Be with me now, my saints and stars, as I approach this glory hole of light which shone all day and now fires up the evening sky like Moses' burning bush that draws me on along this rouging corridor to where the last loose branches in their pink chiffon of leaves half roof the gap to form a pair and every bowl and limb begins to dance the universe's light fantastic prayer. Now lords of wooers taking still a chance on just this cosmic ballet's elegance where nothing is decided in advance. Where hadrons jiggle in their resonance while galaxies beep up and flowers blaze in cedars and wild animals I glance a daily choreography of praise. O oh, suitor, never holding us in thrall, but trusting to the right time of our ways, as in our brokenness we only fall to rise where all who've come have come by choice. Let's dance across creation's dancing hall. In shadows of your wing I will rejoice. Sound now the bird of jazz's trumpet call. Oh, mehol, mehol, cries a lover's voice. Yes, here I am, my madam all in all. Thank you for listening.